Hi everyone, Ben here. Just to make a quick note of clarification, a couple of episodes ago, so before the crash and everything, I made a, a mention of Zolf's sexuality, um, which I wanted to stay in the episode, but due to a mistake with editing and me not making it clear enough, it got cut out. So just want to basically go on the record because I've confirmed this like in replies on Twitter on the Discord, which is unfair because the vast majority of the fan base don't you know, interact in that way, that uh, Zolf is biromantic, grey, asexual. And yeah, that's that's basically it. So I hope that clears some things up. Thanks and enjoy the episode. Welcome to episode 176 of the Rust Quill Gaming Podcast. I'm your host and GM, Alex Newell, with me today I have... Ben Meredith, Bryn Monroe, Lydia Nicholas, and Helen Gould. And who are you playing? Zolf Smith. Hammer to Lahurin out of hand. Sell side bottom. And Azu. And technically, we're all about to be walking in the air. Ooh. Just, no, just we're about to be walking on a bear. Hey. Oh, my bad, my bad. <laughs> walking, walking on, on a bear. bear. <laughs> 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 The floor is quite hairy. <laughs> it smells a little bit. <laughs> I think it is of. <laughs> Redacted. <laughs> so fluffy. Wow. I really, I really enjoy setting up like the lowest hanging fruit imaginable <laughs> and just watching everyone else turn it into gold. Like, great, fantastic. I'm I just mean, gonna keep doing gold? this. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't very. Yeah. Hey, I, that, that almost rhymed in parts. It's more than I'm gonna. I've turned it into Iron Pie, right? And that's as far as I'm going. <laughs> I think I think that song should definitely be on the eventual yeah. Rusticwill album. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the, the, the definite eventual album. Yeah, go talk to Tim. Mo- mostly Tim, but other people guessed. Yeah. <laughs> Helen does a jazz so, version of uh, Big Boy Man. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the jazz version of everything. So, we are all currently now suspended from a platform, being lifted just slightly above a city that wasn't there earlier. Due to the low-level fogs and mists and so on, it mostly just feels like, oh look, a mountain appeared and there's a city upon it. I am going to pick up from there, in terms of time, but with Zolf. Zolf. I've tied myself to the wheel. Yep. <laughs> uh, there was around. an awkward moment where <laughs> yeah. uh, both you and Earhart tried to tie yourselves to the wheel because you're both clearly in charge, <laughs> at which point uh, <laughs> Earhart just kind of backed off and, and gestured for you to go ahead. Well, I thought you were going to... I mean, if you... But I could, I'll tie myself to the capstan. <laughs> it's fine, Mr. Smith. Bear with me. Earhart goes into her cabin. No, no, no the oh. bear's with us. <laughs> <laughs> Pulls out her big captain's chair, which isn't actually that big because of space concerns, but it's something. Lashes that to a railing. Sits in that, then lashes her to it. Lashes herself to it. Well, it's nice to see you've got some of your fight back, at least. Yeah, well, I'm currently sat on a broken vessel waiting for something. A bear lift. Something. Yep, that's... Like, there's... I'll be honest, I'm used to winging it. This is quite extreme, even for me. What can I say? Anyway, so Ra said it was going to be uncomfortable, so let's prepare ourselves for whatever it is. Sure. Really hope it ain't going to use its jaws. Is there a big pause in the conversation? <laughs> it's a really hairy situation. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, there is. Uh, specifically, you all wait for a while and just nothing happens. Earhart is clearly starting to get fidgety and annoyed. And you can go take the lift if you want. Well, I can't now, can I? Because it's... Who lifts a vessel? How are you even? How do you even lift a vessel? How's that even going to work in this kind of a situation? I don't know. I've not really uh, acquainted myself with massive bear logistics, so I assume they've got some sort of solution themselves. They got bear logistics, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like I'd like to delegate that to you, Mister Smith, if that's all well and good. All right. Well, consider it delegated, and I'm delegatedly telling you to sit tight. There is another. Bryn, help me out. Pause. Big pause. pause. <laughs> <Whee>! <laughs> 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 
If you wanted to find out Earhart's opinion at this point, you could poll her. What? Poll her. Oh! No! no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Boo! I, I, I rescind <laughs> your ability to interact in this conversation. I've never heard a more ursinine pun. <laughs> oh, See? That was pretty solid. Oh, That's pretty solid. Yeah, boy! <laughs> that is some good Mr. stuff. Very good Mr. stuff. Smith, there's something that um, I want to raise with you on a serious note before everything goes strange again. <sighs> yes, Captain. What was that? Uh, that that is the um probably my o- oldest friend has died and i really don't have the energy for big talk unless it's very relevant it is very relevant mr smith so thankfully i'm going to take that sigh as a oh, i'm sure that this is exceedingly relevant and hopefully a helpful comment <laughs> captain this is a fight you don't want to start so please get on with it there is an element that is going to be at play here, which both you and I are aware of, even if the others aren't necessarily acknowledging it. Nothing comes for free. Sure. In the event that there is a price to be paid, it shall be myself who is paying that price. Do you understand me, Mr. Smith? Ha. Well, I think you'll have to fight everybody else for that privilege, so um, you can have that Then I nominate later. you as my second, Mr. Smith, because I will intend to. We're not dueling. You're second. What are you talking about? If you're going to make this a fight, it will be. I have certain responsibilities as captain of this vessel. Regardless of my conduct this far, certain responsibilities transcend grudges. Erhard, Captain, look, let's maybe find out what the problem is, what the price is, who wants to pay it, and how it's going to be paid, all right? So let's just wait for that point and then have a discussion. There's no need for grand statements uh, using assumptions. Look, I get it. If if this is you trying to pay us back for the way you've been acting or whatever, you know, proving you're a good captain, it's fine. I already know you're a good captain. You know, this isn't a trade. I think you might be. You know what? Forget it, Mister Smith. Let's just sit in silence. We've gotten quite good at that. <sighs> fine, but look, they're not taking you, and they're not taking the ship. Mm. Well, quite frankly, we need the ship for the whole saving the world thing. So you know. You, I mean, you say that. I, there's there, there's a certain appeal about rocking up to Gweave with a bear, just a big, like a massive. Bear. So what? You're you're <laughs> intending on becoming the bear mayor? <laughs> One step at a time, Mister Smith. That's not that's not necessarily my intent. I'm just saying that you know, there are worse allies to have. Yeah, well, I bloody hope not. Turn up to a strange place and then saying I'm going to become this leader so I can have a fight with a dragon. Okay, now this is just you projecting, Mister Smith. I no, it's. Blooming not, use this thing to fight Gweave. How else are you going to do that? Mut- muttering. <laughs> ask, also ask muttering. Nice, ask, ask nicely. <laughs> Chuckling. <laughs> At which point, uh, I'm not going to bother with the perception checks because you're going to hear it eventually anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine so. There, there, there are certain elements of, like, I would roll a perception check. However, you ain't got a say in it for certain chunks of this. So yeah. tough. The distinct sounds of enormous wing beats start drawing near. Multiple. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> um, the eagles are coming! Yeah. <laughs> I think now might be the time that we're glad we're tied to the vessel, Mr. Smith. I suppose so. Multiple massive eagles sweep down out of the uh, sky and land at various points of the vessel. And by multiple, we're talking like 12-ish large like and I mean some possibly pushing huge like mechanic in the mechanic sense mechanically chonky mechanically chonky birds um yeah cover the vessel and there is a wince from air heart as their various talons dig into it technically doing even more damage in parts occasionally like tearing off a railing and then just shuffling along a bit and then digging in deeper to really get a hold of the deck I don't like this, Mr. Smith. I don't think they were expecting you to like it. Valid point. At which point, all of them um, go still for a moment and then all start beating their wings simultaneously. It is the most ungainly ascent (laughs) that may have ever happened. These are not birds used to carrying enormous amounts of freight. This is not an optimal shape in 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 literally the shape it currently is. 
and bearing in mind as well that because they're all crowded in on one and it's it is an uncomfortable journey it is all over the shop thrown left and right up and down bouncing around it's comparatively quick but uh, i will bounce away from bounce being the correct word uh zolf and Earhart, to join the rest of the party on the understanding that you will be making a journey that will lead you to a similar destination. Your journey is an unpleasant, inelegant, and messy affair. Fair I shall enough. leave it at that. Jumping to the rest of the party, you find yourselves looking up to realise that there is a large, basically, crane above you. Uh, it is a timber counterweight affair, big old blocks of stone kicking around, and it is being used to slowly... Um, lever you across from over the side across the city can everyone please give me a perception check because that will determine what I share actually like finding me dice it's been a long time people it's been a very long time that was a natural one so that's 12 overall keeping up with uh, what we come to expect natural one Azu 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 there's a bear city (laughs) (laughs) Look at that! <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> Any takers on natural one? We got a natural one, natural one. Twenty-seven total. Oh yeah, yeah. I got 27 a nineteen, which is oh, almost no. the lowest cell can get. Soul to Bryn with a twenty-seven. So, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the nineteen, you notice the following additional details. It's clearly built on what is effectively a horizontal palisade. Mm-hmm. So as you're bringing across, there is literally like huge mm. tree trunks effectively are all strapped together where the ground has been a large, like flattened palisade affair. Mm. Um, you notice a couple of areas of what can best be described as parks <laughs> where there is no palisade and at first corn? Ah, mm. no fur. <laughs> fur is, is poking through. Fluffy um, chunky fluff. Is that chunky fluff? And in terms of people, mm. it is crowded because of how dense it is, mm. but it is not overpopulated the way that many cities are. And mm. um, these are not streets where everyone's bustling past one another. Mm. Think more a village mentality, even if it has a high density. City mm. might actually be a slightly ambitious word. Mm. That's more for the look of the thing because it's so built on top of itself. Mm-hmm. This is a actually a smaller group of people using a limited amount of space as much as they possibly can, rather than a vast population, you know, with everyone having a tiny apartment. It, it's clearly not that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Hamid, from your perspective, things that leap out at you are, you notice all those, with the addition of um, population. Specifically, uh, although I would say it is human dominant, it is not by much you see a decent number of uh, elves kicking around. They're probably the second most dominant. You also see a number of orcs and halflings. Not many, oh, wow. but you do, see, you do see some. You also notice one additional uh, factor, which is quite unusual, is shocks of pure white hair seem to be dotted randomly throughout the population. A, a halfling here, a human there, just shocks of pure white hair. Okay. Zolf has white hair. I've done something there. There's some, there's a there's a, I. Uh, well, yeah. I, I think I think uh, Zoya Ross had white hair. So I don't know if Alex is playing on that. Of that, if I played into Alex's hands on that one. All I can tell you is there are shocks of pure white hair amongst the population. There doesn't seem to be a pattern. It's not like a an all women thing or like a all elderly thing. It just apparently at random. Given mm. the side quest. Are there any manimals? Good question. You've beaten me to my next point. So the best the side point quest, of this The side quest place. is also uh, Patreon only, so we should probably at this point explain what we mean by that as well. Why don't you elaborate on that, and then I'll elaborate what you actually see. You, you know what might be helpful for listeners? So I have not listened to the side quest. I wasn't there. Uh, and so anything that I... You, you, know, you won't be able to split... That split... You won't be able to slip anything past the listeners that it goes unexplained because I will ask you. (laughs) (laughs) So, like, who is Zoya for a start? And uh, secondly, what's a manimal? So, uh, 
the Patreon side quest, uh, Into the Wilds, which you can uh, find on our feed if you subscribe to the Rustical Patreon, uh, is a three-episode uh, D&D 5e adventure set in the same world as the main campaign. Ben, Helen and I played different new characters, uh, Zoya, Kwame and Pyoto, uh, and we were travelling into a similar-ish area to where the main campaign currently is and we encountered one of the settlements there which was on the back of a massive bear. Spoilers? What? Spoilers? Uh, I mean, they've already had the twist spoiled for themselves in, in this episode so yes. I think we're probably Love quite it. safe. No. Uh, <laughs> we also encountered... We didn't encounter any people as such but we were tracked by a large humanoid-ish being that we uh, nicknamed a manimal. They had certain ape-like qualities... Uh, or could have been like a, you know a, a sort of a, a Bigfoot type kind of creature of some kind. Was it a furbolg? Like trick thinking in like D and D terms. Do you think or like a knoll or something? I'm not going to answer that. We Fair we enough. sort of interacted with this creature a little, but not very much. We didn't end up what like initiating conversation with them. Is uh, Bryn? Could you please give me a knowledge arcana based on your additional perception? Because the others are getting distracted. Certain of you by elemental, uh, not elemental, uh, engineering aspects. So you're paying less attention to the people. And uh, also I mean, a 27. Andrew, it's a city. Uh, okay. In terms of the 27, there is a very large proportion of humanoid-esque plant and animals. To your eye, interesting. This looks to be some kind of culture that is very on board with awakening as a spell, which is. Quite a rare but not unheard of spell to be used in meritocratic lands. It is basically the ability to grant sentience and sapience to things that don't normally have such things. Just to check, we declassified the brutal side quest, didn't we? Is that on the main feed now or is that still Patreon? I think that's still Patreon only as well. I believe that's Patreon only as well. So there are numbers of animals that are, again, think the sort of humanoid esque Disney version, you know, where you're talking hind legs and stuff. Wait, 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 wait. We're talking like. Fox in Robin Hood kind of yes. humanoid, yes. not yes. like monstrous. Yes, correct. Ah! However, okay. there are a few what can best be described as small ents wandering around as well. <laughs> Amazing. <Spence>. Hot. <laughs> They don't, uh, to be clear on one last point, they don't appear to be doing anything particularly different to the rest of the population. It's not like, sure, sure. you know, they're doing mm. work and others aren't or anything like that. It's just, it's just mm. even for your eyes, quite the uh, eclectic bunch. Yeah. As the platform is brought across in, it is then brought down onto what can best be described as a sort of dock. It's what you would do with a dock if everything has to be got by pr- crane. I, d- I don't know how else to put it. At which point, uh, Sora steps off and gestures for you all to follow. There are a few people waiting um, who are holding stretchers uh, on the dock. In terms of the clothing of everyone else, it appears to be quite a lot of simple but colourful fare. So you're looking at a lot of like tunic tops and things like that. It doesn't seem to be like anyone's wearing big chains or anything like that. But in terms of colours, we're talking like bright yellows, greens, reds. Think more like almost like carnival colouring rather than, say, like drab browns or anything like that. Mm. Cool. I mean, I guess it's not really worth camouflaging uh, <laughs> when you've arrived on a massive bear. <laughs> so they're there, just uh, there. Je- uh, so are our gestures to the stretchers going, um, if, if you prefer, you may, you may carry your fallen yourselves, but we would suggest that they are uh, placed upon these. It is a short walk to the, um, to the central space. Whatever you think is is um, is best. We're in. We're very much uh, in every way. Um, we're in. We're in your hands, uh, and and we we can't thank you enough. So uh, um, takes a moment, looks around at you all, steps across, has a quiet conversation with the stretcher bearers, who then head off. I believe that though tired, your party seems like you would benefit from carrying your own. Please correct me if I am wrong. Uh, y- yes, yes. Um, we would like to do them that. Um, that 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 honor. Although, if if you would prefer to carry them, if that if that would be more practical, because because I don't, uh, we, we we may be quite unsteady Please. on your moving you ground. Would. Um, yes. She gestures towards the stretchers for you all. Unless anyone has something specific to do, I am just going to make use of NPCs as NPCs make this happen. Yeah. I'm okay with that as a thing. Unless anyone really has something specific they want to push. I would like for Azu to help carry Carter. Okay, that's fine. 
I think uh, Azu is the only person of equal height. To, no, no, Cell could probably share one with Barnes. I was just thinking it'd be quite unintentionally comical if you have like cobolds very seriously carrying, like picking up at one end. Yes, you, you probably then, need to uh, match sizes. Cell at the two other, ends like, of the stretch. Yeah. You're going to need to match <laughs> to a degree. We'll, slide we'll down. just go ahead and say yeah. that's fine. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> and start uh, moving through the city proper. As you are moving through, everyone, basically, people are going about their business, but once they see a procession moving through, they all basically step aside and a natural avenue is afforded to you from the dock straight through. People just stand. They don't seem to be, um, like, doing the funeral thing. I don't know how else to put it, of, like, you know, either, like, the, the bowed heads or anything like that. It's just that everyone stands very, very still and clears a space for you to walk through. And then as few have passed through, people continue as if nothing has really, really happened. So more like just being polite and considerate than reverent. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, I would say that you're probably drawing a few stares from, like, children who are occasionally running through, like, the streets comparatively unsupervised. But it's not... You're not more than, like, a, a kind of idle curiosity. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is I can't be clear enough. You are not the talk of the town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to jump to Zolf temporarily as everyone is walking through. Zolf, after what feels like an hour, but was probably only like a few minutes, maybe ten minutes or something, you are plopped unceremoniously on a similar dock uh, with Earhart, who immediately begins unbinding herself. (sighs) Thanks for the lift. Oh, uh, yes, thank you, birds. I I think think they're, um, they're people. Uh, thank you, bird people. I, I what am I? What are we doing here? I don't know what's happening. Um, well, we've crashed our ship, and uh, now there's a giant bear with a city on the back of it, and, and we're there now. But when you say it all like that, it sounds completely ridiculous. Um, could someone take us to our people, please? Thank you, please. I'm, I'm going to untie myself and just have a look around. This place isn't massive, so I'll probably just see at least Azu. <laughs> <laughs> who is who continues to be large and pink so you can see the tail end of the procession in inverted commas um heading deeper into the town from where you are here the birds have basically i say birds the eagles have effectively uh dispersed apart from uh one who does the whole swooped down transformation at the edge of the ship um and gestures for you to follow them yeah thanks very much and thanks for the i did say but thank thank you specifically for you know get our ship up here this is not a concern i would say you might have more trouble repairing your vessel than us fetching it yeah yeah probably but that is a later problem so you know we picked up all the bits (laughs) Uh, may i rejoin you with your your group yeah please at which point you Earhart, and your uh escort let's call them your what's the word guide Thank you. I literally blanked on the word guide. <laughs> I was like, cohort, captain, admiral. Your admiral leads you... Right. Um, so yeah, buddy. Your, your guide leads you through a sort of... Um, a, a route that is converging on the others. Mm-hmm. Though I would point out that you're not afforded the same courtesy that they were in terms of people are just going about their business and you're expected to move through. Because of that, it's far more obvious to uh, you and Earhart the whole like, oh, look, an end. Like just because you, you can't push past people, it doesn't work like that. Um, it's there's there's too many different uh, sizes kicking around. I remain myopic. Yeah, that's fine. You manage to quite easily uh, catch up with the rest of the group. It seems that uh, Sora is setting a comparatively slow pace, and you manage to catch up to the tail end. And so we are all rejoined as a group. Uh, you then proceed through to what feels like the centre of the uh, town. As you make it towards the centre, you see something that's kind of reminiscent of if anyone has ever seen the Globe Theatre. Ooh, yay! A large, round structure, primarily of timber with some, like, um, think of it as, like, plaster. I don't know how else to put it, like, uh, making up some of the walls and so on. But it is a large, circular, thatched building that appears to have an open centre. And it is in the exact centre of what could best be described as a, a as town square, I guess, to a degree. It is not a large building. It's just that everywhere else, everything is around the two to three storey mark, building on top of one another, and there is a space where there is just a building, just one. 
mm. uh, with nothing crowding in on it. It has a respectful distance around it on all sides. And uh, Sora leads you through to the main entrance. Uh, she stops before a pair of large uh, double doors and turns to you. At this point, I must ask, um, as part of this ritual, it is required that a a, a carer, a, a guide, is, is provided for each of your fallen. Beyond this point, I would normally only allow your guides. I would like to offer you all a moment to decide who your guides will be. There is no version of this where we are able to guide them ourselves. It must be someone at, at least familiar. I've got wild. Do you do you need to be magical or what? No. The, to someone they knew? You need to be someone they would listen, at least listen to. Cell turns to Scrock and kneels down uh, so that... Would you... Would you, would you allow me to, to, to guide one of, one of the cobbles? Uh, maybe either Sasha or... This is so much my fault, and I, I know that I can do this. Uh, I know that you, you might want to be the one that goes, but I, I think they would recognise me. Uh, it, it, would, it would mean a lot to me to be able to, to help with this. Scrock goes very quiet and still for a little bit, and then gives you a real deep look. This is someone actually really, like, looking, taking a read on you and just trying to get a sense of where you're going with this. But if you, if you want to go, I absolutely will defer. I understand why you would need this. Sasra would listen to you. Yeah. But if you are going to do this, please remember... This is for Sasra and not for you or your guilt. Oh, I know that. Skrark then just reaches out, gives a sort of pat on your hand and then steps aside, effectively. Earhart does pipe up going, is it possible for one person to guide all of them? Zora's just... This is not how this works. Um, This is less based on authority than it, it is more complex than this it is more complex than responsibility and and it it should be one person for each um per person this is correct barnes yeah do you want to go and get carter <sighs> can I have a word azu yes just a quick one yes Barnes sets aside for a second. He seems quite business-like as opposed to, like, emotionally drawn in or anything. Mm. Intriguing. (laughs) I would, normally. Mm. But it occurs to me that we're dealing with life and death and I can't help thinking that it might be a uh, better benefit for someone with a bit more familiarity in this area to step in. I don't like to ask, but... Oh. I, I worry that I'm not fit for this. Oh, James. Um, if you're... I, I abs- of, of, course, of course I will if you, if you want me to, but this is... You know, I've not done it before. Carter needs the best shot he has. The closest thing to spiritual I got was one time I got really drunk and looked at the stars. It's, it's not... It's not really a thing I've engaged with, you know? I see. Um, well, all right. Um, he, def- at, at le- he definitely knows who I am, at least. Um, all right. She puts out her hand to, like, shake. He, he, um, he takes it and gives a proper shake as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm honoured that you would trust me with your friend. Yeah. Sure. Um, Elder Sora, are, are there risks to the guide? What? How is, is is there danger in this? There are not risks to your guides. There are. What what you face is a, a a conversation, not a journey. To consider it a dangerous journey would be would be a misunderstanding. Your goal is not here to conquer someone. It is to converse with them. Thank you. Um. Well, I mean, Skrark, if it was uh, 
a, a risk I was going to offer to undertake it because I don't think that risking uh, you would be appropriate at this juncture. But if there's no risk to the guide, then I feel like you would be best placed to to uh, guide um, Merc back, Skrark. Skrark takes a moment and goes, Right. I think I should uh, guide Merc. That seems right. Okay. So there are four of us then. Yep. We'll, we'll be waiting here for you when you um, get back. Earhart's uncharacteristically quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no fighting for you. <laughs> yeah, I will say this actually, without a sense motive. There was a distinct change in Earhart's mode, which is, no, I'll punch ghosts on behalf of my team too. There is mm. literally no risks involved for anyone here. Mm. Okay. Yep. This is less about punching ghosts than I hoped. <laughs> I'm kind of ready to punch some ghosts and there are no ghosts to punch. Um, so Earhart's kind of taking a bit of a backseat. If so, Ra, um, if you're all ready, then we will have people uh, bring your fallen in and we can begin. Um, yeah, the rest of us should wait wait out here. Yes, I think that's, that would be best. That's fine. This may take a few hours. Find a pub, and have a drink. Do you have before pubs? of a kind? I would say before we do proceed, there is no guarantee that this will work for all. You must all understand this before we enter. Yeah, we're asking them back, not forcing them. I get that. This is this is the way. Yes, correct. Very well. All right. So we're uh, sort of pushes the door open and then a few um, people inside come out uh, these are wearing grey um, basically uh, not robes but sort of on the way to robes they're not big billowing over the top affairs but they're quite shapeless grey um, affair and they all think ah there you go think more like monk like a like a habit if you know what I mean that, is that what it's called for monks Cass- cassock yeah, it's a habit is for nuns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mix them up. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's a lot more like a cassock. That's the best way to describe it. A grey cassock. Um, actually, that's one question. Um, what are the uh, ancestry of these individuals? Is it like you know you've got sort of the the bird people as the kind of like you know the native Ursans, and then the other like um, ancestries have been invited in, or is it like fully mixed, or like what's the what dynamic are we getting from this? Right. To your eye, so far, fully mixed. Sure. So, so the pr- priests, for lack of a better word, or like the attendants here are. Yeah, there, there are. There would be. So there's four of you. So there would be eight attendants. Of those, I would say five are human, probably an orc, and then you know what? Why not? I'd say uh, two. Yeah, two halflings. I'd say. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I was just getting social dynamics. Obviously, so raw is. Um, a person who can turn into a bird? I don't know. Uh, well, <laughs> I assume some sort of high-level druid, personally. Mm. Oh, of course. Of this sounds class. like a bunch of conversations yeah. we can have at some point. Mm. Sora pushes the door open and these attendants come out, take up the stretches and then gently head inside. Sora gestures to our four guides to step in as well. Yeah, as he waves goodbye to Hamid and Kiko and the others. Hamid is going to try and run up and hug each of you who is willing quickly before you go in. Aw, yep, sure. Aww. As is like, don't worry, we'll be back. I know, just good luck. You, you get too, Sel. And I, I will give Sel a big hug as well. Uh, Sel gives you a big hug back. I offer a hug to Skrark? The best you're going to get from Skrark is a predator, like... You can take it or leave it, but that's what's on the cards. Hamid does a very poor attempt at imitating Skrark's gesture. <laughs> he's, there's, try, there's, he's trying, but he doesn't have the hang of it There's not much bicep showing at Skrark's end, but that's okay. The, the, <laughs> the gesture's still there. And will Zolf accept a hug? You get a shoulder pat. Ooh. Okay. Oof, oof. A, not, a not unkind shoulder pat, but, you know, <laughs> not a hug. <laughs> and on that, we'll close the doors to the, uh, the ritual space and we'll come back in a couple of minutes, I think. Ooh. Hi, everyone. Lydia here. You may know me as Melanie in Magnus Archives or from Rusty Quill Gaming. I'm here to tell you about this episode's sponsor, The Stormlight Archive, Volume 4, Rhythm of War, by internationally best-selling author, detailed world builder, and writer of some of the most fine-tuned systems of magic you will ever read, Brandon Sanderson. 
This series is perfect for fans of tabletop RPGs. You'll love the aforementioned magic system and encounter some of the coolest places you'll ever read about. Ratcheting up the tensions, big and small, that Sanderson began in the Stormlight Archives book one, The Way of Kings, now is the perfect time to pick a side, join the fight, and dive into this New York Times best-selling series. Buy Brandon Sanderson's Rhythm of War, the latest in the New York Times best-selling Stormlight Saga. Just search for Rhythm of War wherever books are sold, or visit the link in this episode's description for more information. And welcome back. I'm going to stick with Hamid for now. Mm. Hamid, you are left outside with the, with the rest of the uh, party. In terms of the space that surrounds this ritual uh, hall, the best way I could describe it is, think almost like a, a paved area, although it is, it is timbered, it is not paved with stone. And there are small portions of, um, like, literally trees, non-awakened trees uh, dotted around the space, and benches and um, urns that appear to be water sources, because you're not going to have plumbing running through a bear that would be bad and effectively it just seems to be a bit of a quiet contemplation space where there are a few people sat around but there's not much happening in terms of the for the sake of ease npcs they all seem to be milling around settling themselves around this place and maybe having the odd quiet conversation but not much what are you intending what are the kobolds doing they are all they're not keeping to themselves but they are in a slightly more i'd say reverent mood than some of the others yeah so i noticed when the the bodies were there before they you know all of them apart from scrap were sort of sitting in a, in silence and reverence next to the bodies and they I'm seem wondering to be doing similar without the, yeah. the bodies there yeah i basically i'm going to approach uh natan specifically and um natan May I join you? Natan looks up, looks down. They all scooch up just a little bit and pats the ground beside themselves. I'm, yeah, I'm going to sit. I'm going to adopt the same pose and sit in silence with them. The best way to describe it is it seems it seems broadly meditative. It yeah. is. There's not really much movement or anything. It's not forced either. Insofar as it's not like like occasionally someone might shuffle or itch yeah. or something, but it's just very much like a quiet almost heads into the circle just sitting and being quiet uh yeah i will i will try and catch uh, uh barn's eye and just give uh, him a nod and be like you know this is where i'll be but i'll see you in a bit barnes gives a nod and you get the impression that barnes has taken it upon himself to sort of keep an eye on everyone however Earhart's very much doing the same thing so they keep catching each other's yeah. eyes <laughs> yeah so there's <laughs> In which case, then, I'm going to jump to the party who are heading into the uh, the ritual hall. Mm-hmm. So, spooky. heading inside, it is not spooky, I'm afraid. Oh. There, there is there is very little in the way of darkness here because it has an open space in the middle. There is a surrounding corridor which appears to have sort of storage for, let's call it paraphernalia. You know what I'm talking, though. You're talking, like, torches, um, a couple of, like, crates over there that probably have some things. There's definitely some incense in a corner, that kind of thing. But as you head through, you head through into what at first appears to be a large, sanded, circular space. There are no markings there. It is just a large, sanded space. It has a slight mound to it. Not much, just a little bit. And the uh, stretcher bearers sort of step through and lay them out in basically the compass points of this circle. Um, worth bearing in mind, this has an open top, so this is not an interior space. There is light, sunlight, sort of streaming into this space. And the stretcher bearers lay them down, then step backwards, keep stepping backwards, and then eventually take up positions back to what is effectively the encircling wall, facing inwards with their heads bowed. Sora steps forward and uh, sort of gestures for all of the guides to gather around for a second. If, if you are all ready, it is worth understanding that this varies on who is involved. We can tell you how to begin, and we can tell you how it will end, but the steps between can vary. Do you all understand this? If you ask us to guide you, we cannot. Uh, you, you are the guides. 
we we only provide the opportunity. Right. Very well. If you all please um, take a position towards the the head of your uh, subject. Sit. Be quiet. Be calm. Be well. Matters will take their own course. Do not be uh, concerned by the actions of your your supporters. They gesture to the uh, people cir- encircling them. Uh, they are here only to assist, not to interfere. All right. Sure. Yeah. Right. Oh, and before you go, nothing here can harm you. That makes okay. a change. This does not mean it may not hurt. Ah. Well, I. Mm, oh, you mean like you mean like hurt in your in your yes. heart? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Oh, oh, right, like a, like emotion, uh, emotional pain. Right now. Yeah. Be ready for someone not to want to return. It is not unusual. Yeah. All right. Sura steps back and gestures for you all to take your positions. Okay. Your supporters then sort of step away from the circle, leaving you sort of in your positions. Yeah, they start their cheerleading routine. <laughs> give me an A, a. Give me an L Give me an I V E <laughs> What is the spell Cell Give me a perception mm-hmm. check Okay <laughs> that in the YMCA. <laughs> Oh my gosh Roll the two Please let me be using these up Now and good rolls later So that's 16 That's fine To everyone A slightly acrid smell starts to uh, move through the space. Cell, you can't place it. I was giving you the chance to... Yep. Maybe, but no, afraid not. No. Nope. If any of you choose to look, it's like no one's saying don't or anything, uh, you'll see that urns are be, appear to be placed near you, which are um, basically emitting quite a, quite a pungent smell. It's unusual. Um, it's a combination of quite floral and quite acrid. It's almost like um, flowers that have been left to, to, to rot slightly and then had some vinegar, something like that. Uh, and they are placed near you, and then for a brief period, the supporters effectively pull out l- large fans. Pom poms, right? No, no. Fan the fumes around the space a little bit, then close them back up and just stand waiting. And then you're waiting. Mm. And then, can everyone please give me a will save? Ooh. 30. 30? I rolled a 10. Well, no, mm-hmm. I mean, it's ten total. Ten total. Yeah. I'm rolling rubbish today. Um, that's 22. So, interestingly, given uh, the will saves, Zolf is apparently the first to succumb in inverted commas. Because mm-hmm. uh, will save is not just about resisting stuff, it's also about getting yourself in the right headspace. Mm-hmm. Zolf, after a while, you are aware that... At first, you have the ambient sounds of the surrounding city seem to sort of drop away a little bit. Then eventually the surrounding sounds within the building itself drop away. At that point, it's just the the breathing of the rest of the party and that drops away. Honestly, the first thing that jumps into your mind is it's very reminiscent of moving through the Borealis, actually. Mm. It doesn't have the, the tones, but in terms of the way it seems to function, it's very similar. It is that slow shrinking of horizons. Mm-hmm. And just with the Borealis, assuming that you don't sort of open your eyes and start trying to wander around or something, nope, it starts to expand back outwards again. The sand beneath your feet starts to feel a little bit more coarse than it was when you um, first knelt there. The uh, building around you seems a lot more open, and the city itself seems to be um, very quiet. And by very quiet, I mean it still sounds like the city, which seems to be characterised by quite a lot of creaking rope, shifting timbers, that kind of thing. But there appears to be no people. Um, I will, once the sort of transition, as it were, has ceased, I will wait another couple of beats and then Mm -hmm. open my eyes. You seem to be where you were before. Mm -hmm. No one else appears to be there, but there appears to be a set of footsteps in the sand from where Wild was lay, leading out of the building follow them sure makes sense so following them through to the edge of the building you uh push open the doors and sorry i I shouldn't say you push open the doors but i'm assuming that you would given where it's leading yeah yeah, i I continue to follow sure so pushing open the doors you can see you do appear to be in in the city there does not appear to be anyone there at all we're not talking apocalyptic it's not Mm -hmm. like there's you know overturned buses and all that it's just it's just empty. It's clean, it's empty, and there's no one there. We're in the spectral realm, is my guess. 
Give me a perception check. Uh, 20. 20, okay. You cannot place it, but you have the distinct impression that Wild has passed through here. You can't see any footsteps or something, and it's very hard to explain, but you have a clear sense of direction that you could track to, regardless of the fact that there are no footsteps. You do not have any point of reference for this feeling, but there is a feeling there. Um, I will uh, close my eyes and walk, uh, either Mm -hmm. until it seems fine or I hit a wall. (laughs) Uh, You don't. It seems to make life a lot easier. Yeah. You walk an unnecessarily long distance, because, like, everyone's played this game before. It's like, how far can I go? I just sort of... Yeah, you pass enough of a distance to go, okay, there's no way I would have done this unless something's, uh, uh, like, at play here. Um, So, yeah, I'm going to leave you doing that for now and jump across to who was second in the list. It was Azu. Yeah. Uh, So Azu is with Carter, correct? Yep. Good. A similar sensation to what happened with Zolf happens. The sounds of the city recede. The sounds of the building recede. The sounds of the people around Azu recede. Then the sounds of the building return. They seem much larger, a bit more echoey, more stone-like. It feels like a much larger space, much colder, and you uh, have the sense of stillness that was not there before, where before, obviously, there was the open top. Now it feels still, or not quite claustrophobic, um, but certainly an interior space, whereas before it was not. And there is a distant susurration of people. People, a lot of people being very quiet. Azu's going to open her eyes then. I have to ask a question of Helen. Has Azu ever been inside a museum? No. She was on her farm, Mm -hmm. and then she was at seminary, and then she was in Cairo, and then she was... Doing this nonsense. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) In which case then I can cater description to that, that's fine. Okay. Azu finds herself in something that feels vaguely reminiscent of seminary. A large stone space with items, presumably holy items or something similar, dotted around the walls. Um, They appear to be uh, items of, like, great age, sort of like a a fractured stone column, a a broken sword, that kind of thing. Uh, And they seem to be surrounding a large stone circular space. It, It very much feels reminiscent of seminary, especially that the murmur of voices who have learned to be quiet in this space... However, you are alone in the space, apparently. Azu says, uh, Carter? Um, H- Howard? Uh, you hear from a distant room, shh. Azu <laughs> heads towards whoever did the shush. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. <laughs> At which point then, Sel, you were with uh, Sasra, Sastra. correct? Sasra, yep. Cool. So for yourself... Mm-hmm. Similar situation, the surrounding sounds fade away, the building fades away, the people surrounding you fade away, and then seemingly nothing happens for quite a long period, at which point you realise you can hear the sound of faint fires, controlled fires, not like an inferno or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be, to your ear, coming from somewhere along a cave or a tunnel or something like that. Sasra? Buddy? Sasser? Do you open your eyes or not? Yes. Okay. You find yourself in a comparatively large tunnel. Phew, because cell is much taller than a kobold. Yes, um, it feels unusually large to you. You're used to a Mm. slightly cramped quality in a medium-sized space. Mm -hmm. This feels more like it is built for large, um, larger creatures. Mm -hmm. There is some kind of um, woven matte rug on the floor Mm -hmm. and there is the distinct colour and sound of firelight from a distant bend in the the tunnel ahead. Uh, Cell walks towards that. And that feels like a natural stopping point for this episode. Ooh. How peaceful. Yeah, it's odd. It's going to be really difficult to sneak in explosions and not feel like I'm cheating now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll find a way. Explosions oh. are one of the things that Sasser and Self have bonded over, so way. it's really quite organic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hear a distant boom. 
<sighs> well, we will return to this and find out what, what shenanigans I have planned for you next week. But until then, bye, everyone. Bye. bye. Rusty Quill Gaming is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0 International License. Today's episode was directed by Alexander J. Newell and produced by Hannah Preisinger. To subscribe, buy merchandise, or join our Patreon, visit RustyQuill.com. Rate and review us online, tweet us at the Rusty Quill, visit us on Facebook, or email us via mail at RustyQuill.com. Join our community on the Discord or via Reddit at r slash RustyQuill. Thanks for listening. Hi everyone, Alex here. I'd just like to take a moment to thank some of our patrons. Vigdis Heithbrau, Guthmundsdottir, Rachel, Some Variation of Gay, KJ, Grayson Center, Kayla Roy, Hunter Harder, Jorge Garcia, Emily Critchmar, Dion Putz, I Think You're Pretty Cool, Autumn Sealbaker, Glora Rigual, Munoz, Rainy J, Popori, Chloe, Myrto Aplanti, Brian Sullivan, Varia Borodina, Ivona Gayor, Asgether Orsk. Thank you all. We really appreciate your support. If you'd like to join them, go to www.patreon.com forward slash rustyquill and take a look at our rewards.